Hello and welcome to There's No Business Like, a podcast where friends and industry colleagues explore topics and interview leaders in our industry of professional theatrical touring. Hey, welcome back to There's No Business Like. I'm Brian Zellmer from KU Presents in Kutztown, Pennsylvania, and I'm here with my friends, Kevin. Kevin Maynard, Quad City Arts, splitting the border between Iowa and Illinois. Josh. Josh Benson coming to you from Marion, Illinois at the Marion Cultural and Civic Center. Danielle. Danielle Van Hook from the Alden and McLeod, Virginia. And Katie. Hey, 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 it's Katie Miller with the Midland Center for the Arts in Midland, Michigan. This week, we speak with a very friendly Midwesterner from Northern Illinois this time named Merrill Miller. And we'll get to that in just a few moments. But as always, I have a question for the rest of you. Do you guys have a favorite video or board game that you like to play? And have you learned anything from playing it that you can apply to your job? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. In my high school theater program, after everyone was done getting hair and makeup on for show, you know, for our show run, the makeup room would actually turn into like a card playing room and our game of choice was speed. So if you know the game speed, you like have two piles of cards and you're trying to put down cards as fast as you can playing one on one against someone else. And I just have this memory of like having six or eight pairs of people stretched across the science tables, all playing speed at the same time while we're waiting, you know, for our cues or the show to start or whatever in thinking more critically about that. Like the takeaway actually is that common activities bring people together and foster sense of community. So like, even though that's not what we intended, we were just like killing time. Like, that's a very fun memory for me. And it was a way that we spent time together, even though we were all there for something else. Like, And that was a thing. I did six musicals between middle school and high school, and that happened every single year. So the idea of gathering and doing one common activity and having that tradition that kind of goes from generation to generation, I think is something that is actually applicable to what we do. So my favorite was GoldenEye as my favorite video game of all time. But to follow up on Katie's, that was what we always played. Like after speech tournaments, we always had speech parties at my house or another friend's house. And we would all always like throw down on GoldenEye tournaments. And I've never thought of it that way until Katie talked about it just now, but it was a that was a shared experience for us then too. That's pretty amazing. Thanks, Katie. Following along on the video game theme, I've always used games like this to sort of like decompress or um, I don't know, just maybe kill some time. But games like Tetris, where you're just sort of like trying to fit things together and like you're under like a time pressure is sometimes stressful. But I do think that I am also weirdly good at being like that will fit there and like, i don't know a couple of weeks ago we rearranged the office and i did literally a rearranged an area where there was like you totally tetris that shit no i did there's like <laughs> mm, maybe an inch gap in between all of the pieces of furniture and i was told by many people that it wouldn't fit and it wasn't right and i was like oh no it's going in there and it looks beautiful and perfect so that's probably tetris I think there's a few games. I think like Danielle said, I mean, I use like video games to sort of decompress after sort of a, a long, stressful day. Um, but I also have a very distinct memory of a 10, maybe 11 year old Kevin uh, playing Ocarina of Time for the first mm. time and just going into the the, the, the great Deku tree. And being able to solve like a couple of the the problems, a couple of things to like get through. And I remember just having that moment of, you know, sort of like creative problem solving. And I think that's, you know, one of the things that I think in all of our jobs, but really this industry, like we do quite regularly. That's what I've realized that I am good at is looking at a problem from afar and figuring out the creative solution to, to, to get to the outcome that we need. Mine is very much like yours, Kevin, and actually Zelda in general, all of the Zelda games that I've played since going way back to even the most current one, which I know not everybody loves, but I just love it for the escapism and, you know, the open world concept of I can just go anywhere I want in the world. It's not like I have to follow a set path. So Josh and I sat down with Merrill Miller from the North Shore Center in Skokie, Illinois, and we hope you enjoy this conversation. Hey, this is Merrill Miller from North Shore Center in Skokie, Illinois. Thanks for joining us. How are you doing today, Merrill? Doing all right. It's been busy. Have a lot of shows. Uh, We're working on our first ever outdoor festival. Why don't you just give us a little bit of taste of like what you do in your role there, and then we're going to get into your background after that. So I primarily book our shows. 
That is the first and foremost thing that I do. And for me, it's a lot of figuring out what works here and what doesn't and trying new things, trying different things. So the venue, if you don't know where Skokie, Illinois is, it's just north of Chicago. I mean, you can, you know, we're close enough to Chicago, you can literally throw a rock in there. So we are essentially Chicago and figuring out the way to kind of change the stereotypical view of this town is, you know, a big part of that is doing it with the shows that we present. Because growing up here, the town is way more diverse than people think it is. It's totally like people totally think this is the whitest town on earth, but that's a hundred percent not true. So we do everything from comedy, music, hip hop to uh, singer songwriters. We have a youth theater program, so it's really all over the board. On top of that, I do our artist hospitality, providing whatever the artist needs during the show, you know, and that's something when we get into my background, that's one of the most important things to me for any show is the hospitality component and there are things that I would like to do more of and figure out ways to become more memorable for the artists here. And that's just something, you know, over time we'll work on. That's great. And we're definitely going to get a lot deeper into those things. But first, we want to find out more about you and how you got to where you are today. Like, what was your professional journey? I went to uh, Niles West High School, if anyone listening knows where that is. It's uh, it's in Skokie, and I played in bands and whatever in high school, and they wanted to play shows, but everyone was too afraid to send an email. Even at that time, I didn't want to call anyone. I was afraid of the phone. But, <laughs> you know, I could send an email, and so I just started with finding shows for our band to play at the school, which the band was also school sanctioned for most of the years, which helped because <laughs> it was part of a club. So we were, you know, not part of the music department, but it was like the rock and roll club, I think was what it was a part of. And they'd have an assembly with the whole school and the school's 3000 kids for us to play that size of a room as like 15 year olds is insane, you know, mm -hmm. and not good tech in the school gymnasium at the time and all, or at least what we could do setting up in like five minutes. <laughs> So that type of thing. And then that morphed into other shows. We did this Beatles tribute one year, which I think was like one of our best shows we ever did. And that was with another school that we partnered with, with their kids. And that was kind of a fun thing. What did you do in the band? Lead guitar. And I still do that in my current band now. I really wanted to play music and that's kind of all I wanted to do. And I uh, went to Co College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So a small private school. It was half the size of my high school. At the time, they had a really powerful student activities department that had a really big budget and allowed us to program a lot of shows throughout the year. And so I suppose in theory, we could have spent the whole budget on one big show, <laughs> but we had to fill up a, a year's worth of shows within our, our venue, which was about 250 standing. More importantly, I was slowly, I don't want to say coerced, that sounds bad, <laughs> brought on to the student activity committee through force I think. <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out what that means exactly i think i know but you were voluntold to be on the activities committee yeah it's voluntold yeah and that was my first real like learning of like what a writer is and what a contract looks like and what advancing the show is and you know all that very basic stuff mm -hmm. moved to nashville after college i had a little break at home in between, but worked at the Grand Ole Opry for a bit in their box office, doing that fun stuff. Did some freelance booking at bars. Just at the end of college, I wanted to book shows full time. Like that was my goal anyway. You know, even though in Nashville, I wasn't finding a full time job booking shows, I still did it at bars with, again, you know, my own band, you know, formed and disformed in all sorts of ways or just myself or friends or, you know, whatever. And, and it wasn't like I was making any money off of it, but, you know, still continuing that experience. So I had it. I actually finally had my first show at what I would call a real venue down there right before COVID and then put the kibosh on that. So. And then moved back home uh, after COVID started and had to basically kind of reset myself, sent a bunch of emails, and I actually got uh, in here on a cold email to my previous boss. I was like, look, I'm moving back to Chicago, and I have all this experience, and here's my resume, and I need a job, and like, you don't even have to pay me. <laughs> 
<laughs> just whatever. And so uh, started here actually part time doing hospitality and um, front of house. So ushers, security, all that. And then when this booking position opened up, I was like, this is what I want to do. Sign me up. So I've been doing it for a little over a little over two years now. What is it like to, to book with 150 other venues, you know, all placed around you? It's hard, first of all. I mean, it's like, you know, playing the largest game of Civ Five ever. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you don't know what that video game is? Because <laughs> everyone's like trying to get resources and they're still building more venues here. And I'm like, stop, we don't need more. We're full. You know, I was just talking to another promoter today and I was telling him the way I go about it depends on the scenario. So if it's an artist that often plays Chicago and that's it, then I may have to pay more to convince them to come play my room. Even though, even though we're so close, you know, sometimes that has to happen. And luckily we're in an affluent area and that's not the end of the world, but obviously we're all trying to do the best we can and get the best deal. That's part of that competition piece. You know, you have to be careful with getting too optimistic about how big the market is because it is it's a massive market i mean there's like nine million people in the whole area that doesn't even include milwaukee we get people from milwaukee coming to shows because it takes the same amount of time to get from skokie to downtown during rush hour it's only 14 miles but it takes the same amount of time to get from milwaukee to skokie but that's 74 miles. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> there's just no traffic. So people do that all the time. But even still, we get 20% of our audience from the city, uh, which is still really strong for a growing venue, I think. We're part of Venue Works, and so another Venue Works venue in the market's Rialto Square, and they're in Joliet. And from here, Joliet's two hours. And that's just like with traffic. For the most part, a lot of people from up in this area or down there aren't crossing the kind of downtown boundary to come to shows. A few minutes ago, you mentioned you're a venue works company. For a lot of our listeners who are students or new to the field, they may not know what venue works is. Can you just take a moment to explain that? Yeah, so Venue Works is a management company, and we manage venues across the Midwest mostly, some some on the West Coast, some in the Southeast, primarily in the Midwest. And so their whole thing is managing venues and trying to find the best way to make that venue thrive in its market. This particular venue is owned by the Village of Skokie, but we're not employed by Skokie. We're employed by Venue Works, and they're doing the management of bringing shows here and bringing the rentals in and taking care of all the other stuff that makes the building work. I worked for a very similar company called SMG back in the day, and they, they were mostly known for mm -hmm. managing arenas and, and a lot of sporting venues. But I was at a 10,000 seat amphitheater that, that they were running, and I was an SMG employee, not the people who own the venue employee. So I know how that works, but we would have people from the company come once in a while to do meetings with us to kind of bounce our problems off of them and just guidance or help or, you know, a support system. So I was just wondering if Venue Works had that kind of relationship or is the the Skokie people like on their own essentially even though you're all part of this larger company. Yeah, oh yeah, there definitely is. I go to a variety of people, some people at other venues, some people here, some people at the corporate office to say, you know, I have this idea and what do you think about it? Do you think this could work? The interesting thing about Venue Works and this isn't a bad thing necessarily because they're growing is that compared to the other places they're at, Skokie is wildly different. They're headquartered in Ames, Iowa, which is a small market, and they have I think the most concentration of venues in Cedar Rapids, which happens to be where I went to college. So I'm familiar with all of those just from going to shows when I was in college and, you know, missed opportunity, not uh, working for them in college. I didn't think of that back then, you know, so I still bounce ideas off of them because there are people who have worked elsewhere in bigger markets, stuff like that. But being able to also show venue works like, Hey, this is Chicago, this is new, and this is what we can do here. I think that's also really cool that they're open to us doing fresh ideas, different things that maybe wouldn't work in a more rural uh, venue but do work here. Has Skokie always been a Venue Works house or when did that happen? No, we were uh, brought on with Venue Works in 2021. Uh, and then before that, we were with PFM, which is based in Providence, Rhode Island. And, you know, I mean, it's it's definitely interesting to see, like, the East Coast attitude versus the Midwest attitude of doing things. Explain that a little further. 
I don't know if I know how, but you know, being at APAP, you talk to people at venues on the East Coast, and they're very like, I don't know. I feel like it's very, it's more rigid out there or something. We're in the Midwest. I feel like talking to other promoters and presenters out here, people seem to be a little more flexible and open to things. Maybe that's just me. Having worked in both, I I can say there's some truth to that. <laughs> so yeah, me, I yeah, I was like maybe that's just me. But you know, Midwest people are Midwest people. They're supposed to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> It sounded like the booking experience that you started out for your band in high school and so forth. That was probably a super valuable experience. And you talked about with your student activities, you know, getting into that work and learning about writers and stuff. But up till now, it sounded like you you did a lot of self-learning. Was there anybody in your life that really helped you come over some hurdles or, or really take a leap in your learning? I definitely do tend to get thrown into stuff and I have to learn how to swim. That's kind of how it's always been in a lot of ways. And I don't think that's a bad thing because I think it allows me to screw up and <laughs> learn for myself than someone doing it for me in some ways. I feel like the mentors I've had and not related to booking, just in other facets have done a lot of the work for me. And I'm like, but how am I going to learn from that? You know, they'd always ask if you're a visual or audio learner. And I'm like, no, I, I learned by doing doing and they didn't get that. And so that's how I learn best is by like, put me into the thing and I will mm -hmm. learn it if I'm doing it. If I'm just watching something or listening to someone in one ear out the other. The one person though in college who I would say kicked my ass was <laughs> our student activities director. Because to be brutally honest, I mean, I was reluctant to join the board. And then my first quote unquote term, I guess, you know, I kind of was like, oh, I don't want to do anything. At some point, I remember her sitting me down and being like, you can't, you can't be like this anymore. That's when I kind of got my shit together as a sophomore in college. And at some point along the way, I realized, oh, this is actually a job and a career. This isn't just this thing I'm doing in school. What was that realization? What, what was I don't it know there? if there's ever one moment I mean, I remember I did a quote unquote semester abroad in New York during college. I remember distinctly that I was in the hotel room that I was staying and I had a, it was pre Zoom, but video call with, it was a different uh, student activities director than the one I mentioned. But, you know, she was like, well, technically, you know, second semester seniors aren't allowed to be on the board because of whatever bylaws. And so uh, I was like, well, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So why can't I be on the board? This is like career training, essentially. And I need to be at these shows and work these shows and do this work to have more experience. I don't want to cut it off early. At least the moment I remember, I think it happened before that somewhere in my mind, but that was the first moment I remember. I was like, wait, 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 I have to keep doing this. I can't not. So what's the crossover from the live event uh, industry to J2ICS that you have. First of all, what is J2ICS? I don't even know what that is. Wow, that, that was, that's an out there question. So if you guys know what iRacing is, that is a motorsport simulator. So I primarily do the NASCAR side of it and race, but there's also, there's Formula One, there's IMSA, which is sports cars, there's all sorts of stuff. And so before COVID, my friends and I started this league on a different video game. And we we're like, yeah, this will be a fun thing to do. And then eventually we made like one Reddit post and it exploded. I don't know why. And then um, and then we just kind of grew it over the years. During COVID, I considered it a job because I didn't have any other job aside from eventually selling mattresses because that was what I was doing all day was building this league. We were doing branding and trying to get opportunities with real race car drivers to come into our virtual races and that type of thing. And so it ended up kind of being a job that I didn't get paid for and that I gained experience from at least on a it's sort of on a marketing, branding, social media side. I consider myself retired from it now because my actual job has taken over and it's hard for me to do it. And so the people are continuing it and I'm still in the Discord server posting memes. Is that, is that why you're currently last in the standings for the Endurance Series? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are you on the website? Josh is like really into this more than you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm in last place in the Endurance Series. I crashed out of the one race I did this season and it's all right we'll we'll get them next year i do race in a real go-kart league that i placed in better hmm. <laughs> last year 
<laughs> so the two of you met last year at APAP. I met you at Indianapolis uh, at MEX in um, September. You're on your way to Polestar as we're recording this. What's the main reason you attend conferences? You also attend IEBA, correct? Yeah, I go to IEBA as well. I go for two different reasons. So, And it depends on the conference. For APAP and MAX, I set up meetings with agents. So, you know, I, I kind of, I guess it's like half boasting, half joking. But, you know, at APAP, I had 32 meetings. So I kind of fill up my whole day that I, you know, want to be able to have that time at those conferences when the agents are also more available to meet where at IEBA and Polestar, they're doing other stuff, other meetings, other things like that. But at Polestar and IEBA, just for my own interest, I always find that those uh, seminars are really interesting because they kind of, I don't know, they push my boundaries, I think. You know, from this past APAP, uh, one of the agents... I'm working on a show with lives in Chicago and we got dinner last night in town. And, you know, it's just like that type of thing grows your relationships, grows your business. And that's kind of my feelings on them, but they're all important to different people for different reasons. And they're important to be at. And I think if venues can make a presence at them, it's, you know, especially when you're either a new venue or a growing venue or something like that, it's good to, you know, put a face to the name with any agents or emailing or calling. You want to explore hospitality in a way that makes it the, the venue memorable for the artist. Right. Can you dive into that a little bit more? What What's the importance of that? What's the legitimacy of that? Is there a reason that you think that's important? Say Chris Stapleton's playing Wrigley Field. And then on social media, they'll post a picture of him holding a Cubs jersey with his name on it. You know, that type of thing to be like, oh, yeah, in 2022, I played Wrigley Field and they gave me this jersey, a Cubs jersey, you know, and that's like a memory of that place. Or Brian Regan played the Ridgefield Playhouse in Connecticut. And what I could deduce from social media was that there was some joke about bowling pins and somehow that was a big moment for them and that show. And then the next show, they made him some sort of like centerpiece or, uh, I don't know, trophy with bowling pins and whatever related to this joke that he told. And it's something to remember that venue. And I think that's important because the first thing for me about hospitality is like, make the artist feel at home. They're on the road. If they're on a bus and on a long routed tour, they could be on the road for three, four months, and you want them to feel as at home as possible. You know, it's just one more thing that you want during their day to go easier. That like this specific type of Cheerios is out of stock at every store in the area. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. That type of thing's out of your control. But the rest of it of just being like cool and, you know, the Nashville term is be a good hang. You know, that's that's step one. And then the next thing is, you know, even something as simple as I saw the other day, uh, having a one of those signs with that lights up in the back and you put letters on and it just says, you know, welcome so-and-so artist. And like something like that, a little bit of like a kind of homey vibe or something to remember your venue. And then when you submit an offer for them again later, they'll be like, oh, I had a good time there. They gave me this gift or some cookies or cake or whatever. And, you know, that makes them want to go back, I think. And, you know, every venue is now going to compete for that. But I think that's uh, really important to try to do. And that's something I'm working on developing here and seeing, you know, what works. Like, I wish there was something we could do like a Cubs jersey. Obviously, we're not the Cubs, so that's not going to happen. But, you know, the same idea. And that's been something I've been rolling around my head for a while now. And, you know, it may just end up being the light board. You know, arenas will do oftentimes decals on the floor, I guess. And it's like, welcome this artist. And it's their tour ad mat or something. It's like, we can't really do that because we have to have rugs and stuff by the entries and for sure, safety. Sure. No, but I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, just a welcoming atmosphere and letting them know that, that you really are happy that they're there. And hospitality is not something we've talked a lot about here, but it, it is really something truly important both from the artist experience and there, there's something to be said for when you walk into a venue that the venue tries oh, yeah. like that. They're not phoning it in whenever you walk in the door, like that there's something to be said for we've put forth effort. And it's very clear that we put forth effort because we appreciate you being here. 
Right. And I, and I think finding that unique individual touch for your venue specifically it is a, a really cool idea mm -hmm. and, and something that I encourage you to continue to pursue. Yeah. And I think every venue should do something, I guess. I haven't trademarked this idea yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, but I think it's important because you want to stand out and you want to, like you said, show that you're putting in the effort to appreciate that the artist is there and that, you know, you want them to come back and you want them to want to come back before they even leave. No matter how well the show does financially, like the tour manager or the artist coming up to me when they're loading out or something and telling me like, Hey, we had a great time. This was awesome. You know, everyone's so nice. We love the dinner. We love, you know, whatever. Um, you know, like that's, that's almost the bigger compliment than, you know, doing crazy business mm -hmm. in some ways, at least for me, like, yeah, you want, you want to do both obviously, but you know, hearing it from them in person, you know, is, is nice. And then I guess something we do actually have in our pocket is local beer. And when that's on the rider, we have a brewery right in Skokie. And hmm. anytime they're at, they ask, it's like, that's what I get them. And I'm like, this is our thing to remind you of Skokie. You know, it's like, take the beers with you or whatever, and, or enjoy them in the green room, bring them on stage, you know, that type of thing. So that's great advice. I don't know if you know this, but I have a time machine and we like to, uh, to go back a little bit in your timeline. And I'd like to bring you back to right when you're about to start. Uh, at your current venue, but you haven't done your first day there yet. Is there any advice or encouragement you would have liked to have had at that time or would have helped you? I mean, it was kind of a whirlwind, I guess, to go back to like that day, because I remember I moved from Nashville to Chicago the day before I started work. So I, I put my stuff in one of those U packs. It's like a more affordable version of a pod and they took it. So I didn't have to worry about that. But all I remember the day before was packing my car with the stuff I didn't want to pack in this U pack. And so my car was full to the top <laughs> and you know, I'm like, I got to make it home. The car can't break down the, I got work tomorrow. I got to be there on time. I got to, you know, think about all that. And, and also coming out of um, the pandemic <laughs> being broke, essentially, you know, wanting to kind of reset things for myself. And so maybe the encouragement is like, I don't know, I, it's, it's hard for me to put into a single phrase because I now looking back on it, it's, it's clear how much work I've put in, I've gotten results out of, you know, maybe it's more of about imposter syndrome or something like that. You know, I don't know. If, I can wrap that up into a nice phrase or something, but I think recognizing that I know more than I think I do a lot of times, or, you know, sometimes if I lose a show to another venue, it's like, that's not necessarily because I don't know what's going on. It's because of any other factor that happens. And, you know, it's not like I get to see other venues offers before they go out or something, you know? So it's just kind of like as buyers, we kind of play poker professionally. <laughs> Um, so I think, it, I think that would be at least some words of encouragement is like, believe in yourself. Maybe that's a good way to wrap it up. Yeah. So Meryl, you've got a, an interesting perspective on what a performing arts center really means or what it should mean or shouldn't mean. Can you kind of get into that a little bit for us? I think we're lucky, I guess, in the sense that we don't have any sort of set budget for booking shows. We just have to make sure we recoup what we spend, essentially, and then hopefully make a profit. So that allows us to probably book more shows than other places that have specific set budgets for their season. But I kind of went into booking this room as you know, what's the difference between me and Chicago theater aside from capacity, you know, obviously Chicago theaters quadruple the size, but if they have Paramore who is not a really a sit down band, in my opinion, why can't I book whatever the similar Paramore type band for a 900 seat room? Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I looked at it was you don't have to stick with just the, you know, kind of same old stuff that plays PACs and things like that. And I always find that anytime you tell some, an agent you have a PAC, they automatically kind of think you have money 
And I'm like, that's not, you know, not necessarily how it works for every place. And it's definitely not for us. It's not like we somehow have some huge endowment and we're like <laughs> able to just be like, yeah, well, here, here's the Rolling Stones doing an underplay. <laughs> You know, like not how it works. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, still doing some of that stuff because we still have that kind of name recognition, but also being like, well, what else is out there? Who wants to play this room? The room sounds incredible. We have incredible speakers. How can we diversify and do stuff that people wouldn't really think we would do based on the name and based on, you know, what I kind of think of performing arts centers in general as kind of sleepy places an additional side of that is how is the room and the capacity of that room serving the community in the best way that it can right and serving everyone in the community the best way that it can right and i often find that the most successful stuff here is the most commercial stuff so the stuff that people recognize right away is the stuff that sells the easiest and there's other things that we book that maybe we have interest in for whatever reason it's like oh this would be good to kind of have this option for these people that want to see it we do that but we want people to come into the building and we don't want to have to you know for lack of a better term like beg people to buy tickets but yeah and, and it's serving the area it's you know who's around this area what do they want to see who's our competition and what are they putting on and what other options are there for those same artists who are playing the same size room in the same market where else can they go and it's mm -hmm. a different vibe you know it's like, I think our backstage is kind of cushy where, you know, maybe some other venues that are older are a little bit more hmm. industrial, kind of that type of thing. Meryl, is there any advice or anything you can think of that would have helped you when you were just entering the field? Because again, we have a lot of people who are either students about to enter the field or just coming from another industry. So just curious if, if you have any nugget of wisdom that we didn't really share or talk about yet that you'd want to pass on to somebody. Be a sponge. You know, so something that I notice with a lot of presenters I meet at conferences, I'll like talk to them about an artist and they'll have never heard of them. And I think that to me, it's kind of disappointing when I'm like, this person did really well in Chicago and you're in a similar size city and you, you know, you should know who this is because one day you might be bringing them. So I think there's two sides of it. be a sponge for like actually doing deals and booking shows and the hospitality and the aspects of your job, but be a sponge for the music mm -hmm. scene too. And that there's so much more music out there than just the like five biggest mm -hmm. tours there is. I like to tell people that, you know, like sure. Spotify has its issues and all that, but like, you can listen to whatever and then go to that artist's show when they're in town if you mm -hmm. can't. Because I rarely spend more than $30, $40 on a ticket because most of the shows I go to are at smaller rooms. And so that part of you know being a sponge and listening to that artist live, listening to their albums, and then knowing who whoever that is is related to, to be like, oh, these are all people that could work in my venue mm -hmm. because my venue likes this type of music and we know that. you know. So I think that's kind of my nugget and you know you don't have to necessarily like everything you hear either i book shows that i'm personally not a fan of the artist but i know that people that come to this venue want to see them like that's part of the job and we want to make sure we hit those audiences but you know i listen to as much of their music as i can so i get an idea of like who that person's related to musically you know that type of thing at this point in time for you what is your favorite part of this industry I mean, I think it it really is the actual, like, putting together the show and making it work. I mean, we can, you know, talk about the festival for a second. That's something that actually our board kind of asked us about. You know, we did so during COVID 2020, I wasn't here yet. But in 2021, we still were doing outdoor shows and they were social distanced and either local or lighter acts and we put them outside in our back parking lot and people really liked being out there successful all that with our smaller space in the building we have two rooms we have a almost 900 seat theater and a little over 300 seat bowl shaped black box type room we were talking about it and we we're talking to the board and then we we're like well if if our resident companies are doing shows in there and we're trying to do a show outside it's not soundproof oh. it just wouldn't work and then on top of that the hotel and the office building right next to us have their businesses going and we don't want to disturb them we even got a few complaints during sound check 
of our previous outdoor shows there. And, I, and it's like, it's just not worth it now. Like that headache of putting it out there and then having to close the smaller room down, that type of thing. And so the plan became, all right, well, let's go to a local park. So the board, you know, asked us last year, we didn't do it. I was like, all right, well, let's start planning this and see where we can go. I've done all the legwork up to this point and I've booked most of the artists. I think it is that kind of curation piece is my favorite part because there are times where I get to book an artist I love and I'm like, now I get to say that I've worked with these people that I listen mm -hmm. to their music all the time and I really like that. I love that too. I, I mean, it's also meeting other artists that I wouldn't have expected to get to know over seeing them over the course of a few shows or when it's someone that, you know, maybe I'm not super familiar with. So it's, it's all a puzzle. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you're just trying to fit it all together and make it work. And I think another thing is th it's never a no forever. I tell a lot of younger bands who email me about playing here. I'm like, like, I have to be honest, like, you're not going to sell 900 tickets. Mm -hmm. Like, you're not ready yet. But like, stay in touch. If you're in town, I'd love to come to a show at a, wherever you're playing. And then when you're ready, let me know and mm -hmm. we'll make it work. Like, that's how I look at it. Even, even when it comes from the agent, that's like, no, we're not going to do it this time. Try again next time around. See, you know, what happens and just kind of that, that's the don't give up mentality. <laughs> Love that. Thanks for joining us today, Merrill. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Guys, thanks so much for doing that interview. It was awesome to get to know more about Meryl. And the big takeaway that I had from it is that I don't feel bad anymore about voluntolling people to do anything. <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> takeaway. Because it could help them get their life together and also provide them with the knowledge of what they want to do for the rest of their life and uh, find a way to put all their passions together into one job. Bam. You're wow. doing the good in this world, Danielle. I know. <laughs> No, Daniel, I appreciated that part of Meryl's story as well. And I love that moment he he spoke about when the advisor, the student activities advisor sat him down and was like, hey, you know, you need to keep doing this um, and really kind of set him on that path. But I also love the moment he when he talked about advocating for himself at the end of his college career and saying like, hey, this actually doesn't make a lot of sense for me to not be able to do this work through the end of my college career, because this is what I want to do. So I think, you know, a lot of college students probably wouldn't have the guts to advocate for themselves like that. And I really was impressed that he did. And he clearly knew what he wanted to do and wanted the experience too to set himself up for success, which I thought was really admirable. And in experience to set yourself up for success, like he took a job just in the box office at the Grand Old Opry while he was in Nashville, just to have another avenue of experience within the field. Uh, and I thought that was really a really smart thing to do. I really enjoyed the conversation surrounding hospitality. It sort of brought me back to my days at the Orpheum Theater and sort of the things that we do now. I mean, Skokie is obviously a little bit different, like the, the competition is very different there. Um, but where I was in Galesburg, I mean, we were a smaller venue in a smaller market. And so one of the tactics that we thought would be best is to provide a really good experience when artists came in so that they would tell their friends and that they would, you know, want to return themselves. And that's, we, we saw that pay off um, throughout the years. And so I think, you know, if more venues like that focus on that hospitality, it becomes not just about the money that you can offer, but also just that experience. Yeah, I really resonated with that part of the story too. And I love the idea of the personal touch of just having something memorable about your own venue. I think that's a really cool idea. Well, and what Meryl said about artists being on the road and making it feel like home and making it feel comfortable for them, it really is true that they are working out of a duffel bag they're on a bus like they don't have the creature comforts that we have when we go home at night and have your own kitchen and your own bed to sleep in and those sorts of things when they're sitting down in a venue even for just a night making that as comfortable and as homey as possible really adds to their experience and then particularly like they don't have the ability to see a doctor on a regular basis or stop at a pharmacy and pick up what they need and those sorts of things so even thinking about hospitality in that way taking care of an artist when they might be sick or run down or really homesick like 
at my time at Interlock and I drove countless artists to Walgreens <laughs> to pick up what they needed, right? Or took artists that were coming for a residency to a local grocery store so they could shop for themselves, right? And make the decisions about what they wanted um, to have in their in their hotel room or in their cabin or whatever for the duration of their stay. So they had a little bit of that autonomy, but also felt really well cared for. They might be big time artists and they might have these names and experiences, but they're also just people who have the most basic human needs, just like you and I do. It's, it's a really important part of the job. It reminds me of one of my favorite artists that would come into the Civic Center was Joe Diffie. And he would literally borrow my pickup truck every time that he was in town. <laughs> and he would often go to Walmart, he'd throw on a hat and nobody would recognize him. And he'd go to Walmart and shop and just be around people. And that was his favorite thing to do when he was in town was just go out and people watch like that. I'm not encouraging people to let people borrow your vehicle, <laughs> but when the pickup man asks you to borrow your pickup truck, you have to say yes. I think you also too have to remember that anytime you're getting FaceTime like that, you're networking and like, sure, you might be competing for when they come back to your market, but like with anyone else in this industry, we're making relationships that are going to last our entire career and possibly beyond. And you don't know where these people are going to be in 10 or 15 years. You might not be at the same place. And that, but the relationship is still the relationship that you built at that venue. And that's a great way too, that if, you know, the artist was unsure about coming to the venue, they're getting to know you as a person and not necessarily like the paperwork and the part of it. We really pride ourselves in taking good care of the artist from like having the stage set up technically, um, making sure we have the equipment that they want. It's all a huge part of our advancing in what we do. And, you know, we do our best with the, the hospitality piece of it. But one thing that we looked at for a while was making sure that we had fresh water. And so we had the, um, the water distribution truck coming in with the big bottles. It got to be like kind of expensive. And we always had these like big bottles lying around. So whenever we were able to get some new things for our green room, we got a fridge that had a water dispenser on it. And, you know, with that, we were able to kind of get rid of these like big plastic jugs. And we bought, I mean, relatively inexpensive water bottles that were imprinted with our logo on them. And we put out the right number for the number of people that are there. And it, with a sign that just says, if you forgot your water bottle, feel free to use and take one of these and, you know, like get water from the fridge. It's cutting down on some of the plastic waste we had whenever we had just plastic water bottles from the store. And people just, they come up to us at the end and like they're leaving with their Alden water bottle, which feels nice. And they're just like, this is nice. This, this was a nice thing. Like I, this feels nice to us. And, you know, it, it didn't cost us very much money. Definitely cost us less than that water company was. And um, it's, you know, it's one of those things to take away. Because uh, I can't afford jerseys. <laughs> I love that idea, Danielle. That's really super smart in a lot of different ways. I also just really love the advice that Meryl had for himself which and others, which was be a sponge. I thought that was really super smart. And that's something I felt like I had a lot more time for early on in my career is doing research on artists and listening to pop radio and just kind of keeping my finger on the pulse of kind of what was going on in the wider world more commercial music world. And I don't have a lot of time for that anymore. And so it's something I personally want to get back to. And I do think it's an important part of our job as presenters is to take the time to listen and research and sit and go through agent websites and look at artists that we haven't seen before and just take some time to familiarize ourselves with new work. Um, because you never know what surprises are out there. And again, you never know who's going to come across your radar and, and really resonate might resonate with your audiences. So I really love that advice. Yeah, I also want to lift up what Meryl said about uh, fostering young artists or new artists that came into a center that weren't ready to perform there. He knew it, but they didn't necessarily know it. And I love that he didn't just turn them away, but then he would advise them and follow them and offer to come see them perform at other venues and just follow them along the way until the point where they were ready to then perform a 900 seat theater. And he'd be there for them and, and ready to, to give them that opportunity. I thought that was really cool. So I want to thank Meryl for taking the time to sit down with Josh and I. Um, he's a great hang. I'm, I'm so glad that we got to meet him, and, and I look forward to getting to talk with him again soon. And I hope you got something out of today's episode. And we'll catch you next time on There's No Business Like. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to There's No Business Like. Our producers and hosts are Brian Zelmer, Josh Benson, Kevin Maynard, Katie Miller, and me, Danielle Vanho. Views expressed in this podcast are ours alone and are not reflective of the organizations we are a part of. Keep up with us at 
knowbusinesslife.com. There you'll find links to all of our episodes and socials. If you like this podcast, give us a like, a follow, a review, or our favorite, a five-star rating. Oh, wait, what was that site? <laughs> I got it. Don't worry. It is knowbusinesslife.com. Do I sound out bus i -ness every time I type it? Yeah, sure do. Stay in touch, my friends. Kevin. Did you really start? Kevin. <laughs> he really did. Was, he like immediately went right into it. It was perfect. Are you fucking kidding me? The one time I said, boy, you get it done on the first try. Uh -huh. did. It was great. And too. didn't screw up once. Wow. I mean, it was a sentence. <laughs> oh, is this for real? No. <laughs> is anything real, Danielle? This is all a charade. You're right. All right. Everybody tuning in from home. No, Where else are um, they tuning in from? Work in the car. I usually listen in the car. Gym. Tractor. Tractor. Dog wash. You could be a chef in a restaurant who has an affinity for arts administration. So or is just a creepy fan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. We want to know where you're listening to our podcast. Jail. What are you doing or where are you? When you're all of our prisoner listeners. Yes. <laughs> Special shout out to you. Hey, uh, you know what? They could be running a presenting series in like a minimum security prison, and we are teaching them all the things. You never know. Shout out to the Sheridan Minimum Security Prison and all our fans <laughs> there. So I guess we all know now what we're going to do if we ever find ourselves in prison. <laughs> Looking for secret talents. While we appreciate the suggestions that you write in and, and we love hearing from you, um, we're just not going to be able to do that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but Kevin can pop bubble wrap with his toes. So well, that's, <laughs> that's is that on his resume? <laughs> and he even has little mustaches to put on the toes. Is this a real talent, or did Katie just make that up? <laughs> I think he oh. could actually. <laughs> <show you that. laughs> I mean, it really can, I think. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yeah, we're going to hold right now while Kevin go goes and finds some bubble wrap because we need to solve this mystery. I'm pretty sure there's some, like, literally, I, there really is. Go go look. We'll wait. You, for real bubble wrap? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we sell we, we sell art. Oh, so like, we have to wrap we the art. We probably do have. Our yeah. listeners need to know. Come on. <laughs> go go get it. We'll uh, if, if, if we get done early, I will happily go get that. Okay. And then, all right. Uh, oh, that was a really good restraint. <laughs>